Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Jazz Standard here in New York City. This week here at the Jazz Standard, clarinetist, saxophonist, and composer Don Byron is playing with his new gospel quintet. And it's right on the heels of an album he released earlier this year called Love, Peace, and Soul on the Savoy Jazz label. And he pays tribute to one of the architects and icons of gospel music, the late Thomas A. Dorsey. Tonight we're going to sit down and talk about the legacy of Dorsey. We're going to talk about the concept of this record and how he's brought another voice to Dorsey's music. We're also going to sit down and talk about how Don has brought another swag, another voice to the jazz clarinet. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Mr. Don Byron live here at the Jazz Standard with his new gospel quintet here in New York City. Congratulations on this latest CD and you decided to really go back to the beginnings which is the church and mm -hmm. you're bringing a whole nother interpretation to the spirituals and hymns. Well I, I think so. Um, you know when I was teaching I really had to break down what I thought the important things that had happened in in the history of recording mu music had been and I really thought the church was underrepresented in terms of, you know, being the roots of rock and roll. And I also thought <laughs> that Sister Rosetta Tharp was kind of dissed as maybe the, fir the first rock and roll musician, or some people say who made the first rock and roll record. And, you know, I'm looking at all this stuff and looking at it, and, and as I was doing the research on Dorsey, just to put a class together, to put a course together, a semester's worth of course, I really started to really feel the the greatness of of the person and the greatness of his songwriting and the ingeniousness of bringing the blues and the church together in an era you know where black folks were actually trying to assimilate and be something different um you know it's almost thought as as universal now that you know gospel music black religious music is a certain way but it was there was really more of a kind of healthy debate about the way that things should go and there were a lot of people that were against what Thomas Dorsey was doing so it took some some strength and he had a lot of great people around him like Sally Martin and Mahalia but you know uh, you know there was a whole organization that he put together he was he was just a brilliant guy you know brilliant guy and see what people don't understand about Dorsey is that he was a blues writer. He wrote over 400 blues and jazz compositions. And, not, and that's not even including the gospel that mm -hmm. we're talking about. And 
he pretty much was the dean of gospel music. Yeah, he was also kind of like the Ray Chu of, of his, his era. So he was actually the guy that you'd get to whip up a record for somebody else. He was hired by several, you know, record companies to put records together, you know, when he'd be presented with fairly raw talent and have to put together a band and an arrangement and get the singer to, you know, he was, he was someone that was accustomed to working with singers, although not necessarily in the kind of choral way that came, you know, that he's most closely associated with. This was more like putting together pop records, you know. He was like, he was like Chucky Booker. <laughs> he was. So, you know, for that guy to decide to create a new kind of church music and take elements of stuff that was considered dirty and nasty and whatever and say, okay, well, you know, this is coming to get, you know, I got the W.A. Knicks, I got that happening, I'm going to merge this together, it's going to happen, there's going to be songwriting, the songwriting is going to be very personal and confessional. It's, he's, he's an interesting guy, you know, like, what, what can you say about somebody that, that really accomplished all of that in, in, you know, maybe 20 years or something like that between when he first started, you know, and then, you know, what he accomplished at Pilgrim, um, you know, all the, all the, the, the singers conventions. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's a lot of stuff that he did. And, um, you know, we should all be grateful because we would have no rock and roll, we would have no soul, we would have nothing. I mean, it's really one person's vision. And, and you know, getting back to, to, you know, when I was teaching, um, you know, there's a lot of instances in, in American music and music in general where, like, it's like one or two guys that really, you know, made the city, you know, like you got your John Hammond and people like that, you know, without their decisions, um, we wouldn't have the music that we have today. Some of them were musicians, some of them weren't. Some of them were writers, some of them weren't. Some of them were just impresarios, you know, like I say, Sal Hurok is you know, a very, you know, in terms of a certain kind of Eurocentric culture, but bringing that to the States, exposing people to the Bolshoi and things like that, um, that's very important. So, you know, when I was boiling down who those people were, it was like, you know, Sylvia Robinson and Johnny Pacheco, and you know, like I was, you know, I was really, if I'm gonna put together a, a course, I wanna make decisions about who those people are. And it was just like, Dorsey, you know, that was a no-brainer. It was just, it was just a no-brainer, and yet it's not necessarily like right on the front burner of what people are talking about in American music. It's not on the front burner when it should really be on the front burner. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not a, a boutique kind of thing. It's one of the major decisions that gives us, you know, Aretha and Sam Cooke and Dinah Washington. We don't have any of that without Dorsey. So, you know, I think he's. You, you know, he's just the, the, the great genius. When I sold my last song When I prayed my last way When I bore my last burdens When I had my last about 
selecting the songs for this project? Because, I mean, there's a lot of Dorsey and there's a lot of uh, Sister Rose at the Tharp that you were talking about, but there had to be like certain songs that you really kind of wanted to bring a whole nother interpretation to. Um, well, I wanted to play Didn't It Rain. I had to play Didn't It Rain. Um, uh, I think with, with Dorsey, you know, Dorsey wrote sheet music well. You know, like, when there's certain sheet music of the early 20th century that, like, you know, everything's in there. Like, all the Gershwin sheet music, everything's in there. You know, like, you could, you could read those, if you can read those charts, you could play at a hotel because everything was in there. Whereas certain other kinds of people wrote very sketchy kind of sheet music or lead sheets with just the basic chords on it. But, like... When you read a Dorsey piece of sheet music, there's all the little harmonic moves that we associate with gospel music. You can see them in the song. They're written into the song to line up with whatever, you know, kind of changes and accidentals that are in the melody. They're not just kind of random arrangements. You get the sense of the way that he played and, and, and what he was thinking harmonically certain moves that that he made harmonically habitually that we you know when you hear them you say oh gospel but they're in they're in the sheet music so my vibe was actually when we when we first started doing the music we just got together and we read the sheet music for days we just read the sheet music. we just kept reading through this book of of Dorsey sheet music we just kept reading it reading it and then you know I was on the other on the other hand I'm looking at arrangements of this or that, you know, the um, various Dorsey 78s, the great gospel music CD, not CD, but LP that he made with, you know, all the big stars on it. Just looking at the arrangement, Mahalia arrangements, you know, just looking at those things. And then just thinking, um, you know, what if you really got a jazz group that wasn't like a smooth jazz group? And maybe even had a little bit of kind of unpredictable avant-garde edge to it, maybe a little bit. And you let that group of people honestly tackle the material, you know, not like, are you a gospel musician or not? You know, you don't, but like, do you have the facility to actually look at the material objectively? Which, you know, like, people always talk about what I did with Jewish music, but basically I took a bunch of guys that didn't know the music, and I taught them how to play the music the way that I played, wanted to play it, and a style evolved out of that. So basically I was saying, you know, I could, I could go get some gospel musicians, but what about bringing, you know, what Farone Akhlaf has to offer and bringing that to a religious music, or like a much more kind of unpredictable, <laughs> kind of crazy kind of energy. You know, gospel musicians, the rhythm sections are always impeccable. But, you know, what Ferron has is more like this kind of crazy genius kind of stuff. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe I can... You know, the singer we used on the record was, you know, she's known as a ba basically a black rock coalition kind of singer, you know, like not a church musician, you know, not necessarily church musicians, black musicians, but not necessarily church musicians.
you know, when I th listen to you play um, the clarinet, you bring a whole nother swag to the instrument. I mean, you bring a soulness to it. You bring a very avant-garde. You bring a soul to it. You bring, you bring a different rudiment to the instrument. Mm -hmm. And how did you go about conceptualizing, changing the direction of how this instrument was being played? Well, I wasn't really gonna play in any of the the, the normal clarinet jazz circumstances, like playing in like Benny Goodman feature. You like you never see any black musicians in that, but they're certainly not gonna be the clarinet player. You know, if you talk about like traditional Dixieland music in New York in the seventies and eighties, there were no black musicians playing that music. So. When I, you know, I was going to New England, my friends were like Donald Harrison and Greg Osby, and I was just trying to keep up with them. You know, I wasn't concerned about playing Benny Goodman's um, repertoire. I wanted to be able to play the Code Train S kind of stuff that my friends were playing. Um, it didn't really matter that there were no other clarinet players around me kind of doing that. Although, whenever you meet anybody that's playing clarinet, they think that they're the modern clarinet player. Every clarinet player thinks that they are the modern clarinet player. It's almost like we don't really play gigs with each other. There's never a pile of us, but whoever we are, we think, you know, Eddie Daniels thinks he's the modern clarinet player and they're not going, to, you know, and that's why you do it is because you think that. But I think the way that I thought of the job of being a clarinet player you know, with the kind of classical thing, I'm not really thinking about that. I'm not thinking about the Benny Goodman thing or the Dixieland thing, but what I thought is, why don't I educate myself classically so that I could be a new music clarinet player, like I could play Messiaen and Schoenberg. And so I tried to at least teach myself how to do that, you know. There were some people that were trying to learn how to play Mozart and Brahms, and I did you study those things, but you know, when I was coming up in New York, I saw a whole bunch of guys that only played new music. They, you know, they only played stuff like that. They almost had more of a feeling for that than probably if you were playing some normal stuff, they wouldn't necessarily sound so good playing it. But there were people on all instruments who were around New York who were basically almost exclusively playing those kinds of gigs. So when I thought of being a classical player, I thought in that vein. Then when I thought of being a jazz player, I thought of, you know, Joe Henderson and Gary Bartz and, you know, the people on other instruments that were playing the kind of lines that I liked. You know, I was open to the avant-garde stuff, but not tied to it. And, and then, you know, I was active in Latin music, active in you know, certain kinds of Eastern European music, like the Jewish stuff. I played some Bulgarian, studied Macedonian and Greek music, because, you know, if you're going to get into the clarinet, maybe instead of just focusing exclusively on this American stuff, you should look at the clarinet as a world music instrument, which it is. And I think now, you know, you got Poquito and Anat, and they're all doing that. But when I decided to do it, you know, I was supposed to be crazy. Like, how could you be, how could you be juggling all those things? But I think the old vision of the, the job of being a jazz clarinet player, it, you, you know, there was no way that was going to work. So it had to be something. So that's what it became. I wasn't really interested until later really being any kind of serious saxophone player. I was always dedicated to this instrument. I just had to figure out what I wanted to be. And... I just made what I wanted to be out of different elements than, you know, Buddy DeFranco or somebody like that. You know, those people had different choices in front of them than me. So, out of my choices, I did those things. <laughs> Thank you. 
What does jazz music mean to you? Well, I think that jazz is not supposed to be literal, you know? Like, it's not that there has to be improvisation. You know, a lot of jazz music doesn't have improvisation in it, but there's something about it that's not um, literal. It's not rigid and static and and that it's it's artisticness really flows from from its non-literalness from the non-literalness of jazz interpretation that because it's not literal it's somehow um in a good moment with good players there's something artistic that flows from its looseness whereas you know you go to you go to hear an orchestra there's something artistic that fl flows from its tightness jazz has a different kind of tightness um but in the middle of it is is a a kind of non-literal idea of interpretation a jazz interpretation should be aesthetically different than than the broadway version of the same tune um there's some there's something different in feeling to Lester Young playing a Gershwin tune and you know the recording with the with you know the Broadway guys on it. There's something there's something different. It's not just the improvisation. There's something different. There's something of the the African aesthetic of the 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 neat and the sloppy and the two and the three and uh, <laughs> all of those things kind of conflicting there's all of that and all of those questions and the answers to all of those questions kind of add up to this kind of artistic um, feeling around the music so I guess that's an answer to your question I, I don't know if I answered it I think I did That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at the Jazz Standard here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Don Byron for his time, as well as the staff and management here at the Jazz Standard. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.